Hello there. Welcome to this webinar series. This is Bill Wilson of Midwest Permaculture. Since what lies ahead is a relatively long series of videos, it covers about an hour and a half uh, worth of time, I wanted to give you an idea of what to expect. Here are a few segments from the 18-part webinar series, which I call The Case for Permaculture. I'm happy to share it with you. I hope you enjoy it. I'd like to ask students, what do you think the number one export is in the United States? And, and when I ask that question, I'm talking about in tonnage. It's not corn. A lot of people think it might be um, soybeans or wheat. It's actually topsoil. Um, if you were to go to the mouth of the Mississippi River and scoop up a gallon of water, put it in a centrifuge, you can measure the suspended solids in that gallon. Then you multiply that times the millions of gallons of water that moves out of the mouth of the Mississippi River, and you end up with a truckload of topsoil every three to 10 seconds, depending on the time of year. Estimates for total recoverable oil on our planet are about two trillion barrels. And when I start playing with these numbers of trillions, you know, I have a hard time asking this question, you know, well, how much is two trillion barrels of oil. I mean, if I had it all in front of me, standing in front of me, and I could just look at it, what would it look like? Would it fill the Indian Ocean? Would it fill the Mediterranean Sea? Well, the only body of water I'm familiar with is the Great Lakes systems. So I decided, well, I'm going to find out how much water is in the Great Lakes system. So how do you find that out? Uh, like any good American today, I go to Google and I type in how much water is in the Great Lakes system, and I get a number. You know, the Great Lakes Board or panel, whatever it is, it says there are six quadrillion gallons of water in the Great Lakes system. Now, I'm in big trouble because I have a hard time getting my head wrapped around a trillion. Now, i got to get a head wrapped around a quadrillion. But they said it was a six with 15 zeros. So I write that down. Then I divide it by 42, which is the number of gallons of oil in a barrel. This is to get the barrel conversion. And I come up with 143 trillion barrels of water in the Great Lakes system. How many trillion barrels of oil is there on the planet? Two, 2.7. All the oil on the planet would not even fill Green Bay. All the oil on the planet would not even fill Green Bay. So oil is a finite resource. You know, there's a certain amount of it on the planet and when it's gone, it's gone. Or when we, as we consume it, it's going to become more and more valuable. And it is the same with coal. It is the same with natural gas. It is even the same, should we decide to go down the route of nuclear, it is the same with uranium. All of these are finite resources. So if we just to summarize the consumption over the last 100 to 150 years, we've used up half the topsoil on the planet. We've used up half the oil, half the rainforests are now gone, a third of all the natural gas and a third of the coal. The goal of a permaculture design, or permaculture in general, is to reverse this consumption model into a creation model. We know how to build topsoil while we grow food at the same time. We can do that. We can grow enough healthy food to feed the world. We can repair devastated lands. We can regrow rainforests. We can produce the energy that we need on an annual basis. Uh, we can create resilient communities and cities. We can improve everyone's overall quality of life across the planet. And possibly, possibly we might be able to retard or even reverse global warming. Through the course of your training, we will be exploring all of these points here and my goal is that by the time you finish your training, you will look at all seven of these points in, in the affirmative and say, that is true. We can do all these things. Well, Becky and I, we want to harvest the rainwater to be able to grow food. So uh, we put some rain gardens in ourselves. Our front yard was totally plain, with the, with the exception of that little dogwood. There was nothing in our front yard except grass. And um, you can see there's one downspot on the edge of our roof there. What we did is we blocked this one downspot. We bring it all over to the one corner so that all the water that comes off of our roof, two-thirds of our roof, comes down one downspout. And it comes down into rain garden number one, follows the sidewalk down a swale into rain garden number two to the left. And then behind rain garden number two, there's actually another impression. You can't see it there, but there's another third rain garden. And when it overflows, you see that black ridge that runs along what looks like our property line? That's a berm. All the soil that came out of these three rain gardens, we created a berm along there, and we've planted gooseberries and currants in there. That'll become a berry hedge over a period of several years. 
So we're forcing the water now to take this long horseshoe-shaped journey around our front yard instead of having it come right down the downspouts and running right off of our property. So if you look at that picture, that's in um, that was actually Thanksgiving Day, and the next picture shows that uh, probably that's probably June, maybe July, the following year. The next picture shows the uh, berm. Um, this is when we were building it. Uh, we just dumped all the soil in a big long row right down the property line, and and then the next slide just shows it to you uh, the next summer. Uh, on that berm, we've got uh, gooseberries, currants, raspberries, strawberry. Onion, green beans, white clover, and comfrey. Another understory vining plant is the squash plants. You know, a lot of us don't realize, but the squash plant, things like beans, the climbing plants, the vining plants, they didn't develop in the desert or the prairie. They're actually a forest plant or a light understory plant. And, um, you know, they have these great big things, we call them leaves, but actually they're solar collectors. And at any given time, maybe only, you know, 20% of the leaves are actually in the sunlight. But that's plenty of sunlight for that plant in order to be able to produce a crop. You know, how many of us are sitting with vertical landscaping or plants in our yards that may not produce food now, but by planting vining plants next to them, we can produce a crop right from, and from the same area. In, in front of this evergreen was a volunteer butternut squash, and we had a, gosh, the vine must have been 20 feet. It was growing out into the yard. But one of the vines got away from us, went behind this tree, went up through the base of the tree, and we didn't even notice it. And I come around the back of the tree later on in the summer, and here's this butternut squash growing through the side of the tree. So I went ahead and I pulled back the branches, and look at what I found. That's an 8-inch butternut squash growing at about 6 feet off the ground. How many of you have a butternut squash tree sitting in your backyard? You didn't even know it. But I'm looking at these other piles on the concrete, and I said, what's going on here? He says, well, you know, we started seeing weeds come up, but I thought, well, gosh, you know, if we can grow vegetables over there on top of that ground, why can't I just grow vegetables here? So he planted, um, started planting vegetables, and one year he had like 25 different varieties of vegetables in these mounds all over the concrete. You can see the variety of plants and flowers and vegetables that he's growing. Now, this is on concrete. You think we might be able to find some abandoned concrete in the city of Chicago so we could grow some lush gardens like this? All you need is soil, and you can create beauty anywhere. What I really loved was his, um, in the fall we went back, we took a, course, a class up there, and uh, harvesting sweet potatoes. If any of you have harvested sweet potatoes, it's a lot of digging. They get down there about 14, 15 inches. You really have to dig deep. It's a lot of work. All Michael did is he took the shovel, he slid it along the, the concrete, slammed it into the side of the pile, shook the shovel up and down, to loosen the soil, then he grabbed the sweet potato by the plant by the throat and picked it up, and there's all these sweet potatoes hanging right from his hand. Totally untouched, unblemished, perfect condition. I'm telling Becky, I said, I want to pour a concrete pad in our backyard so I can grow sweet potatoes. What life is asking us to do is to just stop for a second and look and just say, what's going on? What is it that we've created? And it is time for us just to step into our adulthood. It's time for us just to grow up. It's time for us just to say, enough. Enough is enough. It's time to fix what we've done. Let's be responsible. Let's heal the things that we've damaged. And let's find ways to leave the planet in better condition than when we found it. Remember the Boy Scout? Leave the campsite in better condition than you found it? That's what this is about. That's what we're up to.